Hello, and welcome to the Construction Revolution podcast, where we explore the trends, technologies, organizations, and people that are changing what the construction industry will look like tomorrow. I'm Ian Wright, and today I'm joined by Brandon Carbell, co-founder and CEO of Weatherskin. Weatherskin produces a suite of more than 40 eco-friendly elastomeric coatings, including waterproof membranes, solar reflective roof coatings, epoxies, polyaspartics, polyurethanes, and disinfectants. Their mission is to protect you, your project, and everyone involved with it. Uh, Brandon, welcome. Hey, good to meet you, Ian. So to start off, can you tell us a little bit about Weatherskin and the types of products that you offer? Yeah, sure, Ian. Thanks. Uh, Weatherskin is a construction coatings manufacturer, um, and we offer all green eco-friendly coatings products. Uh, and what I mean by that is we're using um, acrylic and polymers in places of uh, epidermis and, and rubbers and plastics and your, your typical solvents that you'd see in a lot of construction coatings. So we're taking these um, highly caustic materials, replacing them with stuff that is uh, yeah, low VOC, low HAPS, which I can explain later what those things mean, but essentially it's uh, uh, nearly zero emissions. Uh, and that's what, what our products offer. And we've got a wide, wide library of um, coatings, everything from roofing products to wall coatings to floor coatings for concrete uh, we have industrial spray-ons like uh, for piping tanks vessels liners uh, so there's a, a big library the difference about weather skin that uh, sets us apart from everybody is when you come to to our library to our product offering you know that you're getting products that are code compliant with uh, when it comes to uh, new new environmental regulations that are being set and thresholds that are being set on these kinds of products. And you, you have a fairly wide library of products, if I if I understand correctly, right? Over was it forty or more or four hundred? Uh, how many is it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's north of forty for sure. We're getting into, um, you know, we have we have quite an array of of coatings. Uh, we're even into uh, we have some disinfectant. We have. Uh, some concrete additives now that uh, uh, are used to either waterproof or strengthen uh, existing concrete, uh, things that can be mixed right into the concrete or added later. Um, so we are, we're ever expanding that library and we're always trying to stick to, um, you know, our key, key purpose, which is uh, an environmental alternative to the existing products that are out there. We want that that alternative to also perform better than what's out there. I uh, imagine you've had a lot of uh, interest in the the disinfected uh, coatings in the, in the last little while, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That uh, that that was it. There's an interesting story behind that product. We we had a spec out. We just needed a product to kill black mold, and uh, to be able to recommend to. Um, to our clients where we do these washable rooms for cannabis facilities and we needed something to go in and clean these facilities afterwards so so we had a spec out and we were able to get this chemistry that after COVID-19 came out and happened we we sent a bunch of it to the French Quarter in Louisiana when they had a bad, bad outbreak it turns out it's a really powerful disinfectant and we got it tested on COVID-19 and it had about the fastest kill time available on the market so this little subsidiary product that we brought in uh turned out to be some really really unique um chlorine dioxide chemistry that nobody had seen so to stabilize chlorine dioxide that can be used to disinfect deodorize um, anything from a hospital down to a residential space I'm going to jump around a little bit here. Uh, can you maybe let's let's just start with uh, I think maybe where we should have started. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and about the weather skin? You're, you're the founder, so just sort of tell us how how the how the company came to be. Yeah, yeah, and one of the uh, one of the founders, my partner, is Marwan Hillel, and uh, he, he and I have been friends since uh, you know, going back probably 10, 11 years, and we used to do we used to do construction, uh, private home building together. And um, 
I ended up, I, I got injured. I fell off of a ladder and just back to, but it was enough of an injury where I could not be out doing the work that I was doing day to day, which was uh, a large component was carpentry. Um, and at that time I'd been working a lot with ICF block. It's a, it's a foam that you fill with concrete and it's a new type of foundation building system. Um, and we to waterproof that system we were always trying to wrap it with the peel and stick wrap uh, and we had always thought hey there was a spray on that didn't eat away and corrode the foam that would be so much faster and so much better for the the marketplace well here i am sitting sitting on my butt because i because i had this injury wondering what am i going to do with my life and uh i thought i'm going to start to look and see see what's available in these um different sectors in the industry and um i actually found thing strangely enough in the the oil patch industry where they were using a, a really clean chemistry to waterproof and insulate uh their insulated tanks above ground tanks and they were also using it on below ground tanks so i was able to procure that bring it into more general construction for foundations so the waterproofing product was our first uh, first product and and i mean waterproofing seasonal so that everybody was saying hey what's next what are you guys going to bring on next so we moved indoors and started doing the epoxies polyurethanes polyaspartic which are all different kinds of floor concrete coatings and uh worked our way up the walls onto the roofs and and then into more specialty applications so um the company really started from a point of necessity uh I kind of put, put myself in a corner and uh just asked hey what what does the market need and where is the market going to um we were seeing a lot of the early code changes happening that were and and a lot of the language that was coming out where the the industry was gearing towards this the low emissions uh, net zero housing and and the the those that terminology was starting to really uh, become more and more widespread so we thought hey if we can get a product offering and get ahead of that and and uh, be part of that growth that their growth of, of new green technology um, we fit we felt we would have something there that's really interesting so you're starting from uh, essentially first-hand experience right you know you know what's needed on the on the residential side and then bringing in knowledge from uh, a very different different area right you mentioned uh, sort of taking taking insights from the oil industry and applying those to residential commercial construction do you work a lot with your with your clients with your customers on on developing new formulations do you, do you go out and ask them what they need and then um, act that way or are you looking more at where you kind of see gaps in the in the market Mm, both but uh, no we absolutely work on uh filling those uh, kind of new market niches um for instance yeah i'll go back to the cannabis when it when the the facility started these pharmaceutical grow facilities started popping up uh, a few years ago the mindset was we have to build these to uh um, health canada standard you know like a like you would a hospital well what ended up happening, all these build systems that are used in hospitals don't actually work in a in an environment where you have this internal humidity, right? Uh, a hospital doesn't have a whole bunch of airborne water all the time. So systems that maybe were health grade or food grade, they weren't meant to function in the environment that they were now in. So while everybody was looking at how do you build hospitals in North America, weather skin looked at what are the vertical farming industry what is the vertical farming industry in europe been doing for the last 10 years you know these guys have been growing indoor crops for years and years they deal with the exact same environmental um, factors so what have they done what kind of solutions have they found in order to keep these buildings operational and keep them free of, of mold and bacterial contamination everything else that can happen with water infiltrating um, any of your build materials uh, so that you know that was how we developed our products for the cannabis sector uh, there's another interesting build material that's being more and more commonly used called uh, magnesium sheeting and uh, 
and you see it, it's a, it has a super, super long burn time. And it's a very eco-friendly board that would essentially replace drywall or OSB or plywood. Um, the difference is the amount of safety that that, that product brings to a building. Um, when you consider that it takes uh, hours to burn it down versus mere minutes, right? So it's uh, potentially it's an environmentally sound material and, it, and it's a life-saving material. So we wanted to have an offering um, for that product in that industry as well. So we started working with basically every type of that board available, really getting to know it, really getting to create customized products for the specific boards and seeing which systems work, which didn't. Um, one one thing I should mention about weather skin is we are all about R&D and we probably throw away 99 out of 100 products that, that we try because we we're only interested in the best. You know, if you're going to take something to market, you have to you have to certify it. You have to uh, take it through a lot of testing, third party testing. Um, there's no point in spending that money if you don't believe that you have the best product for that usage, um, because those standards are getting set higher and higher. And, and also, you don't want the liability associated if you if you deliver a subpar product to market. So, we believe that. Uh, all we want to deliver is quality, even if it extends the timeline on the R&D process, and uh, so that our customers know that they're getting the best. So uh, it's clear that that uh, sustainability, that, that being sort of eco-friendly, is is a big part of your uh, your company's goal. I've heard it remarked that uh, sustainability it's a little like uh, motherhood or, or uh, apple pie. Nobody's really against it, but it's it's a it's a balancing act, I think, sometimes with with other considerations. So I'm I'm, I'm curious about how you how do you strike that balance between um, you know the economics of of what you're doing, the the R and D research that you're doing, and your commitment to sustainability. Yeah, that's a good question, Ian. Well, <clears throat> if you if you consider the environmental impact of um, not only the immediate impact of saying using a caustic product, and, and we're seeing a lot of products get pulled from the market, right? Uh, you can no longer use lacquer in this country. Uh, um, there's some thinners that are now gone, you know, and it's. Uh, and there's more and more safety regulations being built around um, around caustic products, like uh, spraying anything that's hot applied over six feet. Uh, you now need to have scaffolds so you're not spraying overhead and and risking hot material falling back on your face. You know all these safety regulations that are designed immediately to protect the installer. Right, so. Uh, people are worried about uh, the long-term effects on the installer, the the cancer-causing agents. You know, the what are they breathing? Um, I mentioned earlier VOCs and HAPs, and that's a big part of our language when we're talking about emissions and coatings. So uh, VOCs are, are volatile organic compounds <clears throat> that will leach off of products. So over time, they're they're coming off a of product maybe during curing or during its lifespan. And it's leaching into whatever the environment is or whatever it's in contact with. Uh, HAPs are hazardous airborne particles. So when somebody's spraying this material, what is coming back at them in their eyes, in their in their mouth, and they're getting into their system. Um, so anything that we can do to um, eliminate both the short-term and the long-term effects of uh, essentially using hazardous materials to um, build our, our buildings, to, to protect our, our, our environments that we live in. We see it as um, a long-term benefit for, for the user, the, the homeowner, but the environment around it. Um, and you're, you're right, it would be much easier uh, to bring, um, to not do the research and not to, <laughs> to, to bring clean tech products to the market. You know, there's a lot of chemistry available that you can pick up and and and, um, and brand and, and put it on something. It's very hard to, to find something that meets um, ISO standards, that meets the FDA regulations, that meets um, the Health Canada regulations on products. The uh, CCMC is another certification. 
where they determine the quality of a product uh, of the construction materials in Canada. So that's something that we're chasing actively right now. Um, so the balance is uh, <laughs> the balance is the, there's a lot of a lot more work on the front end, but there's a lot more stuff for everybody involved on the back end. Um, including us and and it might be that initially we have a, a a more expensive product uh variant for the same use but as we produce that um in larger volumes we can generally bring this cleaner chemistry down to a competitive price where where we are competitive in the market and we can um we can outperform and and sometimes outprice the uh the competitors so and it's an ongoing thing you know the being conscious of our environmental impact extends from not only how we produce the materials, how, how are we packaging it? Uh, what is our recycling program for our containers? What are our containers made of? So uh, that's where we're stepping uh, into. It's a little bit of a new world that we're stepping into in the next few years is really honing in on all the facets that, that affect our business and how can we, how can we think about sustainability when we think about our shipping, our packaging, our our um, our processing, even our internal o operations in our our business uh, going paperless, things like that? So it's something we're always striving for. Sure, yeah, I imagine you're seeing sort of more and more demand from your customers to have that in your products as well, right? In, in terms of sustainability and, and the kind of um, eco friendliness. You mentioned uh, shipping, and so I, I'm curious to get your perspective on uh, the sort of ongoing issues that we're seeing in the supply chain globally. Obviously, you're not making um, you know something that requires a microchip uh, in every product, but are you seeing disruptions there? Are you, ha have you been affected uh, significantly by that? Yeah, I'd say, well, our industry, the Conings industry, was hit hard actually by the freeze in Texas. Um, when Texas uh, hit, froze over, there's actually a lot of outdoor storage. Of of resins and um, a lot of the chemical components that are used to make a variety of coatings, polyurethanes, polyaspartics, polyurethanes. Um, a lot of our industry really felt that, um, that hit. Uh, the availability for products definitely, um, as, a, as a lot of them are coming now from overseas to to um, pick up that that lack of products that we've lost and that we lost in Texas, so the industry definitely felt it. We were fortunate; a lot of our uh, raw goods are are locally sourced, as in as in Canadian source. Or um, we have fairly healthy supply chains. Um, so we we have been fortunate. We've had maybe. Uh, five percent of our products see some slight uh, increases in in price due to things like um, even just the packaging. You know the the plastic containers uh, that our products come in the five gallon pails. There's a I'd say the place that we felt it the most was the metal containers for our products that need to come in um, metal five gallon pails. A uh, huge shortage of those. Um, but like everybody, we are we are persevering. We're finding. I think our our supplier list has uh, tripled or quadrupled, and and we have backups to backups to backups for each product that we carry. And it's actually become a. We've looked at it as a challenge and an exercise to really get to know our supply chain, um, you know, and and how to uh, not only strengthen it, but um, double or triple its size and really increase um, our uh, strengthen our relationships that we have within the supply chain and then increase the, uh, the reach that we have within it as well and and um, and it's really broadened our contact base so it's actually we we took it as a challenge and it's been a good exercise and, and we benefited from it. shipping we've had a lot of problems with the the Especially small carrier, uh, a medium-sized package. Um, that shipping industry, we're, we're now pretty well sending anything LTL or full freight uh, to our distributors or to our, our remote partners. Um, just because it's almost, almost seems that things are guaranteed to 
end up somewhere else or go missing or be destroyed if you send them small carrier right now. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I think probably there are very few people that haven't experienced that in some form or another at, at this point. On the, on the more sort of, let's say, optimistic side of things, I'm curious to know, do, how, how are you feeling about the the sort of landmark trillion dollar infrastructure bill passed in, in the US? Are you anticipating greater demand for coatings as a result? Or um, how do you sort of see that affecting um, weather skin? Yeah, if you look at the, you know, just globally, um, construction and man-made structures and, and this the infrastructure built, you know, it's primarily roads and bridges and it falls right in line with this. So is by 2060, we're supposed to have doubled the footprint of man-made structures on earth that we currently have right now. And that's a short... <laughs> That's a short amount of time, you know, and that's a, a lot of population and a lot of concrete and building materials. And um, and so things aren't slowing down. Um, I, 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 I see it as we are in um, the, uh, kind of a perfect storm, if you will, of, uh, uh, of these negative influences and impacts uh, all colliding at once um but i see it is those are perfect breeding grounds for innovation and new companies and, and new technologies to take over i i'm a am i'm foreseeing that we will we'll see some new technologies emerge uh in in shipping and in in construction, uh, the way that we build, the speed that we build, um, the efficiency in which we build, uh, the way that we get materials to one another. Um, I'm seeing the next few years is uh, an exciting next few years because some there's people out there thinking of solutions to the homes that we have today, and we're going to see them tomorrow. Um, can you tell me a bit more about your customers? Do they generally know what they're looking for when they come to you, or are they looking for guidance, for advice? Um, what, what's the relationship like there? Oh yeah, it's a there's a wide array. So typically, we we've got one side of our business will um, you know will will be approached by engineers or architects that are looking for certain performance qualities of products, and and will fall in line with those, and will be specified on a specific project for for a specific application. Um, if it is somebody who is uh, not necessarily part of the construction, but they are the client and um, they're looking to use an eco-friendly product line and, and they found out about weather scan and, and um, you know, heard really good feedback from our, uh, from our current customers and they want to know more about our product offerings. They'll definitely, they'll contact us or one of our, distribution partners and we can walk them through which product uh, we would recommend for um, for whatever application that they may have so it, if they have a floor for instance they have a building they need to do their concrete floor um, we have a multiple options some are good for areas where you're going to have high chemical spills like automotive bays some are good for where you need high impact resistance because you have forklifts and everything else going over it um if you're in high humidity we have products that are made to cure in high humidity environments so we'll really ask them a lot of questions about what what is the environment what are going to be the uses uh, uh on that surface and then we'll spec the appropriate product for them um I'm curious about you personally. What what gets you excited? What's, what's getting you out of bed in the morning uh, and and coming into the office? <laughs> My team, you know, like we we've got not only great strategic partners and um, industry partners, and, but but our team here is like a, a family. It's a, I I leave home to come home basically <laughs> in the morning. Uh, the dog comes with me, you know, and he he's kind of the the go-to feel-good mascot of the office and uh and then everybody here is um you know we care about each other and we we care about what we do and we feel good about what we do too and that uh, makes a big difference when you're you know, when you're able to promote a, a product and a service and a business that uh, its values are in line with with your own personal values and everybody around here is it, 
we all know that we can only do a little part, but we're all trying to do a little part to make this a, a better planet and uh, and to also be of service. That's a, everybody hears uh, of the mindset that uh, the only way we're ever going to ourselves is to, to help others. So we really open up conversations with new clients and new customers with, you know, um, not how can you help us, but how can we help you? Uh, what what questions do you have? What concerns do you have? Um, how can we go out of our way to make you feel like you're protected? Because that's actually our core value. The other skin is, is protection. Our products offer protection to the buildings, to the environment, but we're we're out to offer protection to our clients uh, in the terms of, in the way of offering the best solutions to their challenges. Now, I should ask, are you actually applying the coatings yourself or, or are you providing the coatings and then your clients are the ones that are actually um, uh, administering them? We, uh, you know, for the first three years or so, we had crews um, doing the applications because there's a lot of R&D and, and needing to understand not only the new systems, but the existing ones that we had purchased. A, a lot of our systems had been around for, you know, quite a bit of time but weren't being they were built for one job and they were just sitting in a library so we were able to acquire that in, and take it out into construction and into the mainstream so we're very hands-on we all come from construction so we wanted to know how these things work and really get used to the system so we we're showing up on every job site I think I still show up pretty well to every job site in Calgary but now we we work with uh, quite a few subcontractors that uh, that uh, apply our, our coatings locally, and then uh, quite a few uh, subs and and larger GCs that that rep the products across North America. We've got uh, representation all the way to the southern states and Hawaii and uh, East Coast Canada. So, and up we're we're doing a big coatings project in the Arctic now. So. The weather skin personally, I can't be on all those projects, but uh, but I love to be involved like, like this, you know, over um, over uh, an online chat, walk through the job site using Zoom. You know, that's been a, uh, as annoying as Zoom was at the start of the pandemic. It, it's been a great thing for um, for being able to be in multiple places at one walk through and, and record um, jobs and, and, and essentially be on site when you're in a different city. And yeah, it's a fantastic bit of technology once we got used to it. Sure. Yeah. You, you, now you mentioned the Arctic there. I'm curious, what would you say is the most sort of interesting project that Weatherskin has been a part of? Oh, this, uh, this one might get, um, I'd say the, the most interesting is there's a project going on that is in New Orleans. Uh, there's a big NASA facility called the Michaud Assembly Facility. And um, we're down there walking on that roof. They're trying to design a hurricane-proof roof for that facility. Um, now, this is, I think it's scheduled for 2024. Um, but being on that building and and, and talking solution with uh, the engineering firm that's representing NASA was a pretty unique opportunity uh, to get to walk through there to to, um, to hear about their problems and to potentially be offering a weather solution so we'll we'll find out on that one the uh, the Arctic projects it's a lot of um, uh, prefabbed and modular housing actually and and then full buildings up there as well but our our product line we have a synthetic stucco that uh, can be used to replace like the vinyl siding that they have on a lot of these homes um an issue with a lot of these modular homes and the vinyl siding is they get dropped into high high wind traffic areas and that wind takes that strips that siding right off and then subsequently the the um tar paper or the vapor barrier behind it and you know and you're left with uh, uh plywood on three sides of the home so uh our solution is really effective in those high wind areas high cold areas it uh it's really good in in those really low negative temperatures so the stucco application you know that 
it stays on the wall and uh, and it looks good. And you know, more importantly, it, the 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 coating is not going to blow away like the uh, like the vinyl or the paper. So yeah, it's a cool one to be product part of right now. Sure. I, so I, I have to ask, because I, I wondered about this when I saw that you were doing um, hurricane proofing. If I think of hurricane proofing, I'm thinking of more you know, infrastructure, structural changes. So how, how, do, how do coatings help with, with hurricane proofing? So her, we got involved with FEMA. Um, they have something called uh, the liquid tarp um, right now, which is like a... Um, fabric that they put down over holes and roofs that have been decimated by these hurricanes and they put a liquid over it and it forms a patch. Now that's a temporary patch until the insurance can get in there to fix the roofs. What happens um, in a lot of these hurricane prone areas is there's tornadoes on the proximity of the hurricanes or there's really high gale force winds um, and systems that have seams. So if you think about uh, roll out shingles right there's there's a, a, a certain amount of wind that can get under the seam of the shingle and once it does and it catches it it can pull up a whole run of whatever the build material is whether it's the the sbs shingle or um you know to pay a tart over paper or uh epdm or pvc something like vinyl again can be lifted and pulled off by these high winds and seams are always where water finds a way. So, you know, it, it, it's a penetration or it's a, a seam, and that's where your water's coming into your building. So the big thing with that project and with, with what we're developing for a hurricane-proof roof system is, like our current roof system, it's, it's entirely seamless. We embed a fabric in the base coat of our system overlap that fabric and then there's three more coats on top of it so there's no edge that you can lift up with either peanut or wind so when those winds come in there's there's no susceptible area for it to grab and pull the system up and that is really the culprit not that, that's uh, Again, <laughs> that's where the water comes in. Now, you also get, on hurricanes, you get things like debris and hail. Um, so you need something that's extremely durable, extremely puncture-resistant, uh, impact-resistant. So we have the only roofing product right now that has hail resistance uh, up to two-inch in diameter hail balls. So we've got that. We've got... Um, far over industry standards for freeze thaw cycles, meaning that uh, we can go through things like the Calgary Chinooks over and over again, and it doesn't uh, affect the, the quality of the product. Um, all these things become very important when you consider the, the devastating nature of a hurricane. You really have to understand uh, what are the factors um, and then test for those factors. You know, we're we're not sending this off to labs and testing for for regular hundred kilometer an hour windy day winds. <laughs> we're 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 testing for hurricane grade winds and uh, hurricane grade rains and 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 hail. Well, your uh, location in uh, Calgary that's got to be a pretty good spot to test a lot of extreme weather conditions. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the temperature shocking that we experience here is uh, it's probably the the best place, maybe most frustrating place too for for testing any kind of uh, exterior bound products in construction. Um, you know, where you might have a product that performs good in the cold, you might have one that also performs good in in the heat. Um, where Calgary is really unique, uh, if all the listeners aren't aware, is we get a weather phenomenon called a Chinook, and we can have 20, 30 degrees Celsius temperature swing in 24 hours, um, up the one way and back the other way. So that shock causes a lot of expansion, contraction, uh, stress on buildings, on build materials, on, on the coating. So 
if you ever want to test something um, somewhere that uh, can be pretty rough on on the uh, on the functionality and the 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 life of a material testing in Calgary. Uh, Brandon Carbold, uh, founder and uh, CEO of Weatherskins. Thanks very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for your time today, Ian. Appreciate it.